what happens is is you have the Sony logo that we repitched so that it turns into the sound of tinnitus. So the, the, the Sony logo pings, it rings out, and that reverb tail is like an infinite reverb tail that turns into tinnitus. They say tinnitus here, Tim, not tinnitus. So <laughs> he's probably wondering why I'm saying tinnitus. Um, and that in turn turns into Stephen Price's strings, all in the same uh, key. That then, out of Steve, while Steve's strings are still playing, the the brake squeal of the Subaru that pulls up is kind of in a reverse echo thing. So that's in the same key that pulls up, and then that then turns into the uh, the beginning of bell bombs. One of the reasons for doing that, other than it's really cool, is is that we wanted the audience their ears to be pricked up at the very, from the first th- from the first frame. So, so hopefully, what happens is is that you know you, 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 the lights go down, you, you're rustling with your popcorn and stuff, and then within the first sixty seconds, you understand that something kind of sound is an important part. The point of that was to to try and convey that this movie uh, sound is important, and sound and and sound is something that you you need to uh, uh, register. You know, let's talk about Harlem Shuffle, like that day. How did you set it up? You know, this is obviously it's a long, continuous tracking shot to music playback. So just walk us through how that scene got set up and how you executed it. Well, it was very interesting because I am fortunate enough to get to go on the tech scouts, which are usually a month before. So, you know, we mapped it out. Obviously, there's nobody there, but, you know, the department heads. And they told us where they wanted to put us. And I kept saying, nothing's going to work from this far away. The radio mics are not going to work. The steady cam receiver is not going to work. You know, so there was this beautiful alley and it was about the halfway point, but it was so gorgeous. I knew at some point they were going to want to shoot into it because we pushed him. We pulled him. We did one eighties. We did a three sixty in the coffee shop to introduce Lily James. Uh, so we had thumpers set up in the coffee shop for that dialogue. And, you, say, what's a, um, you, you said you set th- you set up thumpers in the coffee shop. What does that mean? Well, we killed the music so we could get the dialogue cleaned. And it was just a couple of lines in there, which was fortunate. And then went back to full speakers. We had speakers uh, hidden behind city garbage cans, plants. My boom operator is standing in the scene on the phone. And then once we get into the 180 where it gets a little tighter, he's booming the street preacher the woman yelling at the thing and that sort of stuff. But it was interesting because we had a rehearsal day on a Friday. We shot it on a Saturday, obviously to get the access for that almost four city blocks. And um, we were next to a federal courthouse, so they wouldn't let us play the music. So we rehearsed without music. Wow! Wow! <laughs> so I was very happy that that was day one of the production and that it was successful and it was in the rearview mirror. Wait a second. So that was, that was the first day of the shoot. Yes. Oh, my, and it was probably and it was probably just about the hardest thing in the entire yes. schedule. Yes. It's, 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 so, but the nice thing about it was all these departments worked so well with me. Tequila was particularly challenging because we wanted the gunshots, the flashes of the gunshots, to be in sync with the music too. So I provided time code to, um, of course, the cameras when we were shooting Alexis in the parking lot, video assist, Paul of editorial, and a time code feed to the dimmer board. So I provided time code to, um, of course, the cameras when we were shooting Alexis in the parking lot, video assist, Paul of editorial, and a time code feed to the dimmer board. Edgar, a lot of times, would change the speed of the music. So that was always, you know, again, on the fly. So uh, it was all very challenging. You know, every day it was like, okay, have we thought of everything that may come up? Can you guys tell the story as an example of how Denis works with music of Kay's Walk in the Las Vegas Desert, how that started Ron, out? Ron sat in that hot seat. That's your story, it's my a, friend. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> story. <laughs> uh, so there's this big queue that goes there, and they had written all this beautiful music that you know went from him starting to walk from the car all the way to the bees and the whole section, right? It's a three-minute queue or so. We played it, and Denise, like, okay, let's start going through the, the list and say, yeah, no, maybe not. No, I'll take that out. I like that one, but no, let's do We just kept eliminating everything. And I'm like, I'll back up a little bit. There was um, 
a moment uh, halfway through our final or so where we were told by the uh, legal department that we couldn't use any sounds from the original. And we didn't. And we had had... We didn't. We had had certain sounds that were like a nod to the original. Well, yeah, because I would think you really would want cool, right? Yeah, you would want to. Yeah, yeah, you would want to have a little some Easter of, egg, a little, yeah. little. Yeah, yeah some yeah. of them were the spinner sounds, you know, elements of that, and there were all these big drum hits that, you know, the big classic, bah, like that. that you think of from, from like the, the opening. Yeah, uh, that's montage where it came Blade from. Runner, right. right. I had taken those from the first film, blown them out to seven one, and that's what Ron started with. Yeah, and then Mark calls me at nine o'clock at night. He goes. I just got a call. We have to get rid of all those sounds. You're a drummer and a percussionist. Can you play and record some tonight and bring them in? And I said, sure thing. I, so I stayed up till like three in the morning playing all these drums and recording stuff in my home studio. And I mastered them all in 7-1, brought them in the next morning and started putting them through the whole movie where they were, you know, replacing everything, including the very first sound in the film, yeah, you know, okay. the opening title. Right. Uh, so back to the Vegas walk, those were huge drums in that, and we had deleted everything else. I was okay. I said, Denis, all I got left are the drum hits. He says, we'll play it, see how it goes. We hit play, and we sat back. It was like, boom, and then nothing. It's like this light wind and footsteps. It was so creepy. We all went, oh, wow. <laughs> it was really cool. It's way more eerie. Yeah, yeah that's, right? that's when mixing is the most fun, when you've got a bunch of people together, and suddenly something like that happens, and everybody in the room knows that it's happened. The first time I saw the film, the sequence, you know, they're in Vegas and Kay and Deckard are, are fighting in the, 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 the showroom with the malfunctioning holograms. That was the scene that just I completely took my breath away. Like I just was just so exciting from a sound perspective. So can you talk a little bit about that scene? Because I also understand that that went through a little bit of an evolution. Yeah, I mean, it, it started off as a sequence um, scripted very differently where um, Deckard was sort of using a cacophony of different music to 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 um, to lose Kay in that sort of uh, in that arena. That is to say that when we entered that that scene, the first thing we would have is um, Elvis singing, and then it wasn't glitching out. Originally, the idea was you'd have a whole performance running the whole way through the scene. Oh, but on top of that, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, superimposed on top of Elvis. Um, first Marilyn Monroe singing uh, Happy Birthday Mr. President, um, Liberace playing the piano, uh, a Bollywood dance troupe, a tiger, a, an elephant. I remember it just, it just got insane. There was like this just more, more, build up more, of yeah. insanity. A cacophony, really. Um, and that's, a, I mean, in, its, in itself is a great idea. Um, it just turned out that when we played the first cut of the film back with that in its original incarnation, it First of all, it was visually and sonically confusing, which was sort of the idea. But, uh, you know, visually we were losing where Deckard and Kay were in the room. It was just kind of cluttered. Visually, it was, it was cluttered because of all of these elements that had been filmed in separate passes. So to some extent, Joe Walker was then able to look at what he was able to remove. And it was his idea, maybe we have like a broken projector and maybe Elvis is just sort of sporadically appearing around the room. Um, this left us with a problem of, you know, what are we going to do with the sound? And, you know, originally the idea was that uh, we don't really hear anything. We're being, there's this cacophony of music going on. Yeah. Continue with your story. Yeah, there were sounds like we called it the motorcycle sound. There right, was, or the seagull. Or the seagull. Yeah. Are you talking, you're talking like, so I, I watched the film again and like the, and some of the Los Angeles city soundscapes, there's this, what sounds like a really loud um, engine revving. Is that's that what you're talking about? That's yeah. the score. That's bad. That's the score. Yeah. <laughs> that's, cr it's, I thought that was you guys. That's exactly. Right? That's yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. thing, you know, yeah. you never knew what was what. He's getting credit for things we did too. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> there were times I'd solo so I'm like, oh, that's mine. I I thought that was Doug's. <laughs> <laughs>on the visual design of the creature and the sculpting, and you know, like he sculpted the maquettes himself. Like he, he really got in with the with the production design team that was working on the creature and really w did it with him. W was there a similar involvement for him with the sound of the creature? Because I can imagine that was that must have been must have been equally important to him. At, at first, no. Uh, it evolved though. I mean, um, <clears throat> yeah. At first, there was a there was a lot of room to breathe. You know, like he. It's in the script. We know what this guy's meant to be. He's not 
He's not a, a monster. He's a, he's a creature. He's an entity, uh, and he's a romantic lead. And so that was all kind of like laid out in the first meeting. You know, he he touched on that, but he knew he didn't need to elaborate any more than the script already had. It would be a waste of time, you know. Um, and so it was kind of just a blank slate. Um, for me personally, I knew that the audience would need to relate with this guy. He had to be a romantic lead. He had to be something that we can identify with. If, the love, can, if the love story doesn't work, there's no yeah, movie. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And so um, in order to sort of, you know, meet the audience in the middle, right, because you're asking a lot of the audience to, to get them to, to empathize with and be kind of on board with this, this beautiful relationship that develops between him and Eliza, um, really the best way to start was with human sounds, humanoid sounds. And, and so like, you know, ultimately I wanted him to sound um, unusual and without being alien. I didn't want him to sound inhuman. And so I started with my own voice and then added animal sweeteners to that, uh, some recordings to, um, to honor the gills, like the, the liquid rolling in his gills, because a lot of that is built into the script and the design and everything that you, that you sort of touched on in, in terms of how much work went into building this creature. Um, and then we, uh, for a final pass, brought Guillermo in and he gave us a, a sort of breathing respiratory layer that sort of, once all of that got in there and there, a lot of massage went into that track, um, wide track, you know, um, you wound up with something that sounded like a humanoid, a believable, convincing, you know, inventive entity, yeah. Yeah, a Guillermo, personality. Right? Guillermo, Guillermo talked early on, like from our first meeting, about vocabulary and about uh, the conversation went very quickly from what voice artist are we going to get to voice the creature to Nathan providing tests using his own voice and the the riddle was solved, right? Immediate approval. Immediate. <laughs> no voice. We had our voice artist. Oh, interesting. Okay. And he's here. Yeah. <laughs> right? So did and you that, get into, you got, went, in, you, got in, did they, you got into SAG because of that? I, I wish. <laughs> I, was, I did get credited. Guillermo and I were credited for voice of the creature. So, yeah. but, but there's partially Guillermo's voice as well. It is. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And th this is, this is what I mean. Like when I, when I say that, like, you know, it, the process with him evolved, I should say with them because it was with Guillermo and with Sydney and with Cam. You know what I mean? That process evolved over time from being just sort of like, let's throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. You know what I mean? Well, hey, it's stuck. Now let's work on it. Um, when, when I started bringing my system in to work with them uh, in person, um, that's when the vocabulary started to expand. Do you know? Because like when you, when you focus on a single scene, you can really deck out one scene and detail it out and make it sound pretty and add every little steam hiss and, you know, create reverbs. But then when it's time to do the whole movie, you kind of have to broad strokes it, right? And so, you know, in the beginning, it was just like a one long pass of straight performance. And I played that for them. And it was missing so much because it's a single layer. It's a single channel of a, of a creature that would ultimately become... 64 tracks wide, you know what I mean? And so they, you know, I think that they got it though pretty quickly because the notes I was getting back was, okay, so in this scene, the emotion isn't quite what we were going for. You know, obviously it, it wouldn't be a Christopher Nolan film if there wasn't a little controversy about the sound. Um, <laughs> Did we did we make it too loud? Uh, I'm always tickled by these conversations about you know the the you know the questions about the dialogue intelligibility for Bane or you know in, in Interstellar or you know questions about the noise level in, in Dunkirk. But what I wanted to kind of open up to you guys uh, in terms of a question is: it feels like Chris Nolan as a storyteller is just using sound in a fundamentally different way than most filmmakers are. So can you talk about a little bit about that and maybe why that manifests in some differences in the track than than maybe the audience is used to hearing if you go to the opera you do not understand every single word of that operatic singing right you do you enjoy it as an overall element and is moved by that overall element yes you are we have become such a spoon-fed society with dialogue 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 gotta understand gotta read lips and i think people become lip readers because that's what they're focused on, not the idea of stepping back and saying, what do I get from this? If a person walked into a room, 
uh, and holds a gun up, you know, something's going to happen. Right, right. You don't have to say, I have a gun and I'm going to hold it on you. Story is told by the picture. So Chris's ways is, I think it's more of a art form of saying, let the audience kind of decide and make up their mind with a scene. Right. Because Chris has said over and over and over, because there's a lot of times that we don't understand certain things of why we're doing certain things. But he says at the end of it, he says, did you understand that scene? Well, yeah, the Moonstone helped these guys out of the oil slick. Right. You don't have to understand every single word of that scene. You understand that there's a rescue going on and they're pulling guys on board. Right. So the understanding of the scene is Chris's intent. Let your audience develop their own timeline of that understanding. Let it unfold. Yeah. It, it unfolds at different rates, too. Some yeah. people, man, they get it right off the bat when, you know, something's going on. They don't need to hear the dialogue. Other people, it's like, oh, my God, what did they say? And then they start worrying about what they thought they missed. Well, that really doesn't have anything to do with the scene you're watching. So that's where I'm coming from with it. It's funny because with Interstellar, which had the big controversy about the music kind of overriding the dialogue, when I saw it, the first time I saw it, I thought it, it didn't bother me. I'm like, I understood the movie. I knew what was happening. I knew that the that he, McConaughey was leaving and his kid was hugging him and they were saying something like, you know, I love you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll never see you again. But I couldn't hear it. But I knew that. Right. And, um, and then I watched the movie a couple more times when the whole controversy happened. And I thought... I don't, I don't see the controversy. I understand the movie. Mm -hmm. Like it's my, I recorded the dialogue that's being obliterated in parts by the music, but it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. Why is it bothering all these other people? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was a, a, a long, interesting, quite fascinating process, uh, to come up with that sound and to, and to, and to, um, and to have it evolve from the kind of this beginning distant, Mm -hmm. howl that slowly becomes a scream that slowly just becomes this ear piercing almost animalistic yeah uh, uh so know. without asking you to give away the secret sauce how did you create the sound um well we i built the siren i i, I got an air raid siren and put it inside a steel drum and uh we rigged it up took it out in the desert and fired it up and that was sort of the pure the i would say in quotes the pure component of mm -hmm. the of the of the sound um uh and it probably was not far from what they originally sounded like because they were simply air raid sirens right. uh, you know and and mounted um, onto the onto the plane right yeah. I, I think the, the the stukas had enormous dive brakes too that opened up when they dove to regulate the speed of fall <laughs> Uh, I'm sure they added something to the sound, but most of it was the, was the sirens themselves. Um, uh, and then, and then we just started experimenting with how to amp that up and how to make that more, uh, it, it, less literal and more, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it just had to, had to say terror. Right. And, um, and, and unstoppable terror. The siren was something that was mentioned a lot in the in the you know historical references, and and we knew it would be very important. So that was one thing he mentioned when we first talked about Dunkirk. Um, uh, he and he just I had read the script. He just gave me kind of a a brief you know rundown of the things he was thinking, and um, uh, um, of course a lot of that we moved on from later it was it was a constant evolution and i don't think uh, i i think chris's uh uh genius is that he's he never stops searching and looking right it's not a it's not a fixed the script is not a fixed uh a fixed uh version of what the film's going to be it's a it's a blueprint which he's exploring which one deviates from as one learns the you know, learns the film yeah. and, the, and as the film is being discovered. We, so we touched a little bit on the production tracks uh, and, and obviously, you know, your job, your job is to, in, in some ways, is one of the hardest ones. You're, you're on the set when the cameras are rolling, capturing dialogue and, and production 
uh, soundtrack that then goes to Richard King's team to edit and then ends up in Gary Rizzo's hands for mixing. Tell us a little bit about the process of being on Chris Nolan's set and, and gathering sound. I can imagine this was this movie was particularly challenging for you. It was. I mean, this is honestly probably the hardest movie I ever did. It was uh, it was mostly the elements, the, the rain and the water, the salt water, the boats. Always like we spent so much time on the water. I think I was like downstairs on the moonstone for like 40 days, like out on the water. I mean, it's just, you know, thankfully I don't get seasick. It turns out I didn't know, but, um, it's, I think the thing about Chris is like, he wants everything to be real. He wants to shoot in the place where the thing happened. He wants to shoot with real boats. He doesn't want to CG stuff. He doesn't want to do green screen. So, you know, the hardest thing is just whatever elements are in the real environment in this case, especially wind, there's tons of wind. It's even uh, just on the beach at Dunkirk, there's kind of a steady 30 mile an hour wind all the time. It's, when I went on the scouts, I was like, okay, the wind is going to be the biggest issue here. And then it turned out salt water also a big issue. <laughs> just uh, we'd go out on the mole and the waves would hit the mole and it just come like right over your head. And it's like just protecting all the gear. I, everything was over the shoulder pretty much too, because you couldn't use cards had to carry everything everywhere. Wow. But, um, you know, and then whatever the conditions are, you just try and get the best sound you can. So it was uh, it was challenging at times. 